Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Rebag, your premier destination for luxury resale. Elevate your style with our curated collection of bags, watches and fine jewelry. At Rebag, quality is our priority. Each piece meticulously vetted and verified by experts, ensuring your investment is nothing short of perfection. Buy and sell finds from the world's top brands, including Hermes, Chanel, and Cartier. Access expertly crafted and hard-to-find pieces that redefine luxury. Your next investment awaits at Rebag. Get 10% off your first purchase with code REBAG10. That's 10% off the luxury you deserve. Don't miss out. Head to Rebag.com and enter code REBAG10 at checkout. That's R-E-B-A-G-1-0. Burrow sofas are built for the way you live. With thousands of possible configurations, their five-seating collections fit any decor. From classic mid-century style to sleek contemporary design, Burrow sofas are made to last and grow with you. You can add seats whenever and easily assemble your updated sofa with no tools needed. And free shipping always? That's just the cherry on top. Right now, save up to 50% during Burrow's spring sale at burrow.com slash ACAST. Burrow.com slash ACAST. Since 2013, Bombas has donated over 100 million socks, underwear, and T-shirts to those facing homelessness. If we counted those on air, this ad would last over 1,157 days. But if we counted the time it takes to make a donation possible, it would take just a few clicks. Because every time you make a purchase, Bombas donates an item to someone who needs it. Go to bombas.com slash ACAST and use code ACAST for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas.com slash ACAST, code ACAST. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder. Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all of my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I am just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Dr. Jan Eppingstall, a Melbourne-based counsellor who specialises in working with people who hoard. She has also carried out research in this area. Jan, how are you? Excellent. Thank you very much. A little hot today in Melbourne, but um, you know, I suppose that's what you get during summer. I have to put up with it. Just the fan on, t-shirt, shorts. How about the weather with you? Is it good? It is. It's February in England. <laughs> it's cold and grey and wet. Grey, grey, grey. Oh well. Oh well. At least it's not thirty-five degrees. Yes, indeed, indeed. So today we're talking about rigidity and psychological inflexibility in hoarding. So this first came up in one of the first episodes we did together, actually, which was about perfectionism. So Mm. we're going to have a really deep look into it today because it's potentially really key to understanding at least some of our hoarding and making changes. Mm. So on digging into the research papers about psychological inflexibility, the first thing that struck me was that it is correlated with a huge number of problems from students procrastinating over their college work, which I thought was a very meta thing for a university to study, (laughs) 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 to eating disorders, to depression, to excessive smartphone use. So could you start by explaining what psychological inflexibility is and why it's something that seems to be related to a whole range of mental health conditions? Yes, I can. I can do that. 
Um, but before we start, we kind of need to understand the foundation upon yes. which that this inflexibility, psychological inflexibility is based because it applies to everyone. So everyone will have a psychological inflexibility, flexibility profile, if you like, not only those with clinically significant, you know, pathologies. First, we need to acknowledge that all humans struggle with social and psychological problems for a start, you know, relationship issues, anger, depression, impulse control at some time in their lives. Agreed? It's 100%. actually kind of abnormal not to have experienced yes. some of those things, isn't it? I mean, you really are, you haven't yeah. lived if you're not experiencing those things. I mean, it could be fleeting or it could be lifelong and everyone we meet, even those who on the face of it have it all, will have had it sometime in their lives, so something they couldn't cope with and have needed support. So ACT academics and practitioners wanted to kind of create a unified model of coherent processes that were supported by psychological science that can be applied with what they quoted as saying with precision, scope and depth to a wide range of clinically relevant problems uh, of human functioning and adaptability. So they saw that focusing on the symptoms and syndromes like we do it like we do with the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, they didn't really offer kind of like a unified therapeutic approach that could be used on any type of disorder. I mean, researchers and practitioners have been developing manualised treatments for specific issues for years, you know, oh, this one for eating disorder, this one for hoarding, this one, um, and none of them could really be used with all types of symptoms and syndromes effectively. So they were able to identify these six core features that they believe are responsible for human adaptability. So they're processes that underlie what we do, how we think, how we behave. And the, the, develop, the developers of ACT believe that they kind of control the whole show, if you like, these, these underlying processes. And to be and clear, ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy. Therapy, correct. Yes, acronym, we, acronym BAD, acceptance and commitment therapy. We need to make sure people know. But basically they started out with the six processes that made humans psychologically adaptable and then considered their direct opposites. Yeah. So it's this dimensional approach, right, and it's grounded in extensive research. So we kind of need to dispel the myth that psychological flexibility or inflexibility is a thing. It's actually like a model of psychological health and psychopathology, and there's these six core processes depicted in like a hexagon. So on one side of the model there's mindfulness and acceptance processes and then on the other side that relates to commitment to behavioral activation processes so it's kind of like it's a hexagon and there's these six points on it. so does that kind of yes make yes. sense it's not one monolith it's kind yes. of these different things so each of the six core processes are on that continu continuum from least flexible to most flexible um, acceptance, which is that curiosity and making room for stuff, so making room for negative things in your life and not wanting to push them out. The opposite of that is experiential avoidance, which is doing all that we can to avoid and push stuff down or out or away, um, which is inflexible. So diffusion is looking at your thoughts, so seeing them as just words, uh, not as as the truth, whereas cognitive fusion is looking from your thoughts and, and viewing them as kind of rules, strict rules that need to be followed. Then we have flexible attention to the present moment, and that really is just about being in the moment, experiencing what's happening to us uh, in all its forms right now. Inflexible attention is when we're worrying about the future and ruminating about the past, you know, we're never really in the moment. Then we have self as context. Don't ask me too much about this one. It's <laughs> a little bit uh, esoteric. But the idea with self as context is that there's this transcendent sense of self, that we're the same but also 
like kind of our wise mind, like where this almost like this transcendent, transcendent sense of self, hard to explain. I can't fully grasp it myself, but I get the kind of concept. Yeah. Again, it's like looking, you know, outwards, not not looking inwards. And then we have this um, inflexible side to that, which is attachment to the conceptualized self, which I fully understand very, very well. And that's seeing the world as you think you are. So like kind of that, you know, and you had this story. I have a story about myself and this is how I live my life according to that story. Whether it's true or not, whether it's um, helpful or not, that's how I will run my life. Values are really key. Uh, the, they, they're freely chosen principles that we live by, but we can also be at the opposite end of, um, of, the, of the flexibility continuum and have this disruption of values where the values are pliant or fused. Our values are based on what other people think are important, not what we think are important. So they might be values that we picked up from family, from society, whatever. We haven't chosen those freely. We're just following along with the other sheep. Um, Committed action is taking steps towards those values. So as you can see, there's kind of this, um, the the, the hexaflex has this two-sided, two parts to it. And then the inactivity or impulsivity is where we're living in this state of inaction where we're using a lot of experiential avoidance and cognitive fusion and we're not actually able to take action towards those values. So it's got quite an active perspective to it. It's about the way we actually take action and we choose those values very, 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 very carefully so that we know that those values are pulling us towards where we want to be. They're not goals, but they are like a kind of compass for our lives. And that's kind of the core of ACT. And that's kind of the hexaflex, if that makes sense. It does. And when you started talking about the hexagon, I knew it had a funny name but I couldn't think of it so I was thinking of flex again which I also quite like <laughs> they call it the hexaflex and I don't think that um I don't think I don't think Steve Hayes really likes it but he's just gone with it because it kind of came up someone called it that probably an Aussie I could see why it's stuck I like it it's stuck I like yeah. it a hexaflex is kind of kind of cool it sounds cool and hip you know so it makes sense with that context of this being a very nuanced thing and everybody is somewhere on multiple lines that of exactly. course if people are struggling with eating disorders with you know with any number mm. of mental health problems it's kind of psychological inflexibility could play a role in that exactly exactly so there was a research paper by Shuang Yu Fang and colleagues. I will um, link to all the research papers in the show notes. And they looked at acts for hoarding and found basically that the higher, the lower the degree of psychological, inf- uh, <laughs> I'm trying to not to double negative myself. The lower the degree of psychological flexibility, the higher the hoarding behaviours. And also the, the difficulty discarding and over acquiring were also linked with psychological inflexibility in their clinical sample. So why does it look like hoarding and psychological inflexibility are so closely correlated? Uh, well, we've talked a little bit there about the different elements and we've discovered that any psychopathology, as you've mentioned, that we pick would be on that continuum. But I did find both in my research and in my work day to day that experiential avoidance and cognitive fusion are, hot, are extremely high in people who hoard. Not only that, that they ruminate over the past, why they kept or threw something out and they worry about the future of how they're going to get to the other side of the hoard. Um, They have values that are strong, in some cases so strong that they're rigid enough to compromise their health and safety. And that was kind of the real reason that I explored ACT for hoarding because I just saw the anecdotal evidence. It was such a fit 
that I kind of had to go down that path because I could see, look, there's things here that might help. Um, and the other thing, the other tricky thing is about measuring it. Like in this study, they used the um, the AAQ-1-2 or something, which is like kind of a global sort of measure, a short questionnaire for psychological inflexibility. And sometimes there's confusion around that in research. Some people use separate, I actually use separate measures for each thing. And at the time there weren't good measures for everything. So mm -hmm. sometimes that's a bit tricky as well. Yep. Because it's progressing in in, in terms of research, yeah, it's it's going to get better and better. The um, information we're going to get from research is going to be more targeted, more specific as we go. But that is why I kind of went, hang on a minute, this is, yeah. The more I read about ACT, the more I read about the elements of the, the processes, I kind of went, sounds like we're talking about, you know, hoarding quite specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. And the, that same paper by Fang said psychological flexibility, so the positive, can assist individuals in consciously accepting adverse life events and adversities with an open mindset and help people mm. persist and act on their value consistent goals. So the goals that, that accord with the values they have. Mm. This might be a big ask, but could you describe what psychological flexibility looks like how does a person think or behave when they are psychologically flexible yeah um it's kind of easier almost to look at the negative and then <laughs> look yes. at the negative of it to look to look for the positive options yeah. so if you if you look at like say we look at a person an example of a person we'll call her emily um and it doesn't relate to anyone I've worked with. It's just like a way to help you kind of understand. So Emily's a toddler and she has a favourite teddy bear. And we call that like a transitional object, something she used to kind of offer that sense of safety and security while gaining independence from her primary attachment figure. So the teddy bear is taken without her permission because her parents don't think she'll miss it. They just, one day it's gone. So to a toddler, like this adverse event, was highly memorable and Emily doesn't wish to experience that grief and anxiety again. So she kind of labels both the absence of the possession and the accompanying emotions of grief and anxiety as bad, like we need to avoid that. So thereafter, whenever something similar happens, like an older symbol damages her favourite toy or parents remove toys as punishment or give them away to those worthier, she's kind of conditioned to avoid those feelings of loss by kind of vigilantly monitoring and protecting her possessions. So the first thing we have is cognitive fusion, which is basically when we believe what our mind's telling us, despite what the environment tells us. So we're not actually reflecting on what's happening in the present moment or in our environment. We follow those rules and we believe they'll keep us safe from feeling uncomfortable or anxious or sad, right? Anything negative, we don't want it. So we see the world from our thoughts and don't look at our thoughts. So if someone like Emily had had some therapy perhaps and she got to the bottom of this sort of strong attachment she had to her stuff because she couldn't let go of it, she talked to someone and they said, this is what, this is what we think is happening. Can you start looking at those rules rather than from them? She would then be able to, you know, if she, she, like Emily's sitting there looking at all of her stuff and she believes like she'll feel like she's dying if she lo loses or lets go, of, lets go of something. So she doesn't test it if she's psychologically inflexible. If she's flexible, she kind of goes, I wonder if that's really true. Let's see if I'll die if I chuck that out. Let's just check. Let's just test it. That's that, in, that's that flexibility. We look at things where we kind of turn them over in our minds rather than just <laughs> accepting them to be true. Um, so that's how she would react within that area of, um, of, di uh, of diffusion, of behaving in a flexible way. 
Now, experiential avoidance is that unwillingness to remain in contact with those private experiences, all right, the bodily sensations, emotions and stuff. Um, when she's behaving inflexibly to protect herself and her possessions from that kind of acute anxiety, she lives her life according to those rules. She doesn't deviate from them. When they pop up in her mind, they may not even actually become conscious. She just lives that way. That's just yeah. how it goes. I don't do those things. I don't touch those things in my life. But if she was able to, to, to approach those in a flexible way, she would be able to sit with that and allow it to be not necessarily resigning herself to the fact that those negative things always happen and that's just the way it is. It's more about making space for it, making room for those things, being with it, having it sit next to you, not take take over your body basically. It's like it's a difference, I, I guess, between being like a, I don't know, being invaded by aliens or... <laughs> Or just being their best friend. I don't know. You don't want to be taken over by it. You want to be there sitting next to it or having having those negative things sit next to you. But don't push them away. Just let them sit there. It's making me think of years of panic attacks and trying to make them stop. This has got mm. to stop. Calm down. Calm down. This is awful. Mm. Calm down. Calm down. And it was when I got to a point, after, I mean, after years when I realised what I needed to do was go, oh, hello, That's, <laughs> I see you, this is that thing, and <laughs> it feels unpleasant, but this, oh, this, it always goes in this order, doesn't it? That's interesting. Mm. And, oh, this is, this is, yeah, I can feel myself getting hotter. That's, in, it's like a physiological reaction but my brain's creating that isn't that kind of almost clever and you know that kind of looking into it and being Intel curious intellect intellectualizing yeah. it right like looking it and thinking about it yeah a it took away a lot of their power and mm. since that shift I'm not saying I have not had a panic attack since um but especially if I spot it early then I can, I can approach. I'm more likely to be able to approach it. Like if if I don't spot it early, it's a lot harder to you know to move into that kind of thinking when I'm full on panicking. But if I exactly. spot the early signs, which I often do because I'm very experienced at panic attacks, um, mm. then I can try and observe it and note my observations mm. rather than get caught up in it quite so Yeah, much. one of the, th the ways they describe it is being hooked by it and yeah. using that as almost like a like an image, like an image of someone, you know, those hooks that they used to use in vaudeville. Yes. And they, you know, that, I, I always think of that makes me kind of go, hang on, you're getting hooked by that thought. It's pulling you in a direction that really... It, it yeah. needn't. It's just a thought. But that intellectualization, and I know you said before that one time, and I love the story, and I've told it many, many times to clients, and it's been really inspirational. When you were telling me about you were about to go on stage for something and you were having a panic attack, you began to have a panic attack, and you're like, oh, I see. I see you there. Look, I haven't got time right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I really want to talk. Yeah. I really want to talk. I want to nut this out, but I, I just don't have time for you right now. I'll be back. Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've told people, I, I, I swear it has just been such a brilliant yeah. anecdote. It has worked so well with people just going, wow, can I do that? And then yeah. they try. Yeah. And often and you can. Voila. Yeah. Voila, you can. And as you said, if you catch it early enough, that's, that's absolutely the, that's the trick. The trick and if, you're a bit too if you're a bit too tired, if you're not really tuned in, so practicing being tuned in is good too, you know, making sure even when you're not having a panic attack that you occasionally check in with yourself. Yes. How, what, what am I actually thinking right now? What am I actually feeling right now? All of those sorts of things can give yeah. you the experience you need when you do actually have yeah. one of those 
tough days where you've had a panic attack and you've got to try and relax yourself. But um, inflexible attention is linked to all of this, right? So everything kind of links up. It's all, they're all related to one another. We disappear into the moment. We, sorry, we disappear from the moment into our thoughts and we're not in the present. So that's exactly what we've just been talking about is being aware of where you are, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, bodily sensations, all of those things is is a way to to actually make decisions from a place of that wise mind, not make decisions from a place of anxiety or or, or, or rumination. Make that decision from somewhere that's in the moment. Um, and, again, attachment to conceptualised self has been ruled by that story that, uh, you know, we are, you know, we have of who we are. It's kind of like we create this private logic. This is who I am, you know. I'm the type of person that does this. That's not something I can do. I've never been able to, whatever it is. If we're attempting to be kind of a, like that self as context, if we're trying to be that wise mind, we need to, you know, be able to say I'm those things and, you know, I've never been able to and I'm going to try and do it differently. It's that, it's like that yes and stuff that we talked about last time we we uh, did a podcast because I think that we can be two things at once. We definitely yeah. can. You yeah. Know? And that's and one of the things ACT talks about a lot is we can be more than one thing. Definitely. And we're talking more about yes and later on and it's Mm. so yeah it's that whole oh I don't whatever Mm. I don't go out at night I don't whatever your thing I don't eat a few years ago I forced myself to try all the foods that I was convinced I hated Mm. because I realized I hadn't eaten most of them probably since I was seven and I had no idea as an adult what they even tasted like, really. So I made myself try everything. And what was actually true was that bananas remain horrible. Mm. um, (laughs) And a couple of things remained horrible. But most of them were either fine or actually nice. Mm. But I had been a very rigid (laughs) intrusion from a cat there. I love it. Sorry. (laughs) Um, I had been a very rigid, I don't eat those things person and I tested it out and now I eat more of those things. But as soon as you say, even just to yourself, like you said, I'm the Mm. kind of person who that becomes, it's not a description, it's a limitation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's where that that's that's the whole kind of box and dice right there is that it's about being able to take a chance, be creative with who you are and what you cuz cuz we're not we're also not the same person when we're with everybody. We're a different person in, in all the various I mean, we can, if we did personality profiles, and I know that um, I think Scott Barry Kaufman did a heap of stuff around this. You know, if you measure personality in different contexts in diff- for the same person, you're going to get a different yeah. different personality profile. So we're not the same person with everybody. But the idea is that underlying us there is this constant sense of self who's always there observing what's happening. And that's really being the observing self like we like we're talking about is kind of it's it's kind of freeing it's like oh i'm just watching all these things happen and i'm not being impacted i'm not 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 i'm not reacting to them i'm just being it's really quite it's quite freeing i find yeah. um it's hard to it's hard to do but it's again yeah. something you have to practice you know and linked into that values of this freely chosen, these are principles that you believe are important in the way you live and work. And we can we can have particular values and not act in a way that's coherent with them. And that I think is quite 
common with clients I work with. They'll have all these really strong, strong values and they can list them. You know, they'll tell me this, 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 and this. And then when it comes to the actual moment of decision-making, even with just one object, those completely... (laughs) <laughs> yeah it completely disappear and it's it, it's the focus on the one object not the overall this is the way I want to live and that's the hardest thing I think for people with um with hoarding problems to do is to shift shift easily shift their attention from the micro to the macro it's really hard they're not they find that super super difficult I'm, I'm having huge difficulty with that absolutely mm. I can look at a pile and go most of that has to go but as soon as I dig into the pile every item is an exception for some reason yeah, exactly and it's something about that I, I think there are ways and I and I have dug into it I did dig into it a while ago and I don't wasn't really that happy with what I found. But there's got to be ways to kind of tr- almost train your mind to do that shifting between macro and micro. Yeah. There's got to be some kind of, you know, meditation or mindfulness processes that we can use. And I'm sure there is. There'll be someone out there who will contact us and say, hey, what about this, you know? Yeah, do because let I us do know. Think that is really, really, that would be really awesome. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it is hard though. I find it too when I start, you know, working on something that's ha- that holds a lot of emotional weight, oh, but I want to keep them all. I want to have all of those things because I, I feel like, a, you know, I feel like all, I feel all the things you guys feel. I feel all the feels, but I have to, kind of have a bit of a stern talk to myself and say, well, hey, you want to have things a certain way. You want your life to be a certain way. You want to be able to do, you know, you want to be able to craft. You want to have space for all those things. This is going to stop you doing the things that you love that are, you know, values driven. So choose. Yeah. And I'm constantly doing that, talk, but it is hard to remember those values as you're working through the micro. Uh, we're all a work in progress, people. I, I I can say that for sure. Yeah, so then there's, of course, inaction, which, again, is, <laughs> you know, inaction. If we're taking, a, you know, if we're, if we're actually taking action, like I'm speaking about there, if we're taking action towards those values, we're actually able to set aside those worries and those the ruminations we're able to set them aside they they can stay there we don't want to push them away because that's no there's no point they'll only rebound twice as much we just need to sit there with them and recognize that we need to move in this direction this is the direction we want to go in and those other things can stay there but they're not going to stop us from moving in a direction straight ahead towards what we want and I and I guess that's how that's how people with flex psychological flex high levels of flexibility that's that's how they conduct their lives. But nobody's perfect. So <laughs> I make this podcast because I think it's important. I started it as an outlet for myself, but it's become much more than that. And I hear from people all the time about how listening to me talk about my experience and interview specialists and experts is helping them. Hearing those stories makes the time and cost absolutely worth it. But if you want to help to ensure that the future of the podcast is sustainable, you can donate to help with costs. To send a one-off or recurring donation, just go to Overcome Compulsive Hoarding dot co dot uk slash donate thank you so there's Mm -hmm. another paper by this one's by jennifer craft and colleagues and they say in the context of hoarding psychological inflexibility may manifest as responding to thoughts as if they reflect reality Mm. um for example i would not be able to live without this diary rather than as thoughts that show up in the mind, which then leads to saving. How can we spot this kind of psychological inflexibility 
in ourselves. Because as you said, a lot of it is about recognizing when it's happening. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think practice practicing observing your thoughts is one thing. But one of the best ways I've found is to get clients to use thought listings. So it's basically just saying aloud what you're thinking about the item as you're making the decision. Because if we try to practice observing our thoughts, some of us, look, there's, well, we're, there's a lot of neurodiversity out there. Some people can't visualise stuff like that. Some people can't notice it. Some people don't have that little voice. Bizarrely enough, there are some people who don't have, because, you know, I know bizarre, right? You and I, we've all got, I've got that little voice. It's constantly there going, me, 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 me. But there are people out there who don't have that. Yeah. So if we uh, can be, say it aloud. To be fair, I could do without my voice quite <laughs> I know, a lot of the I time. know. I quite like the silence. It would be quite nice not or to if, have that Or if it could just be a bit nicer to me, that yeah, would work exactly, as well. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just, you know, I'll be, but, you know, cut us some slack. Exactly. But just saying it aloud, you know, if there's a no, a can't, a should, I shouldn't, you know, whatever in the se- in the sentence, then kind of flip that into curiosity mode, like we were talking before, of going, oh, that's interesting that I'm thinking I can't do that. Really, why is that? Let's think about that rationally. Try and rationalize it. That's hard because it's often very emotional stuff we're doing. But say the sentence again, and then you know, try and imagine if you have got you know, mind's eye, imagine each word is like a post-it note on a board and just see the words for what they are. They're just words. They're not the truth. Um, Would you really drop dead if you let that diary go? Really? No. Your mind isn't always right. (laughs) And it does does have your best interest. It, It is trying to protect you. You know, that's what it's attempting to do. It doesn't think that you're, it doesn't think you're, it's worried that you're not able to cope. It worries because it's kind of the younger you who maybe couldn't cope in the past or it's it's some version of you from, you know, from many, many decades before going, oh, are you sure? Really? Maybe maybe be better to be safe. Don't try it. Um, but, you know, you can thank it like you do. Thank it for protecting you. But you're going to do what you need to. Thanks heaps. That was really kind of you to say. Um, even if it's nasty, <laughs> even if it's nasty, <laughs> just say thanks and, and move so, on. But that idea of saying it aloud, that, that that can change things. When I kind of do the is that true though kind of quest, you know, I absolutely mm. must keep this because Mm. And then I do, yeah, but is that true? My brain goes, yes, of course it's mm. true. Because mm. but what's really helping is if I then add a, really? <laughs> 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 so it, and at that point, I will start to concede that maybe. <laughs> that is so if, funny. Yeah, it's I do that too. I do that too. I go, oh, yeah, no, and I'll have the list, you know, I'll have that list of things in my head, like, well, it's true because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. And I go, really? Are you sure? Oh, that doesn't sound right. You know, I often <laughs> say to myself, oh, that doesn't sound right. You know, come on. And sometimes I'll add in a little bit of a, you're being a drama queen or, you know, yeah. or I'll add in the FFS. <laughs> like and yeah and quite often at that point is when I go oh this is that thing where (laughs) where you think this because this (laughs) oh this is where you think that because of your childhood and something happened and then but oh who cares about that that happened ages ago and then you move on exactly it's when you start to you know psychoanalyze yourself in the moment is when you know that you're on the road to psychological flexibility. Yeah. And you can have fun with it. Have fun with oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know, this is, it's, it's, it's actually kind of fun <laughs> kind of <laughs> testing it and going, yeah. you know, really? Yeah. Just, and, I, it's all about nudging. It's mm. not about flinging yourself into complete discomfort. It's about yeah. just nudge because... If listeners are anything like me, they're 
walls are so strong and so reinforced and so everything <sighs> that it takes a few nudges. I don't get there first time. Now, you sort of go, uh, uh, and you might have to come back. Yes. Another day. A lot of that, yeah. A yeah. lot of that. So give give yourself some slack, people, because it doesn't happen overnight. People don't change, you know, <laughs> completely overnight. It just doesn't happen. So being less rigid, less mm-hmm. flexible is something I'm working on really hard. I've told this story before, but it's relevant again. When we did that perfectionism episode, one of the first things you said was that perfectionism is a form of rigidity and inflexibility. And I had this immediate reaction of that is not how I want to be. I don't want to be a rigid, inflexible person. That does not reflect who, what I want my core to be like. Mm. And it was a really strong reaction that I was having in my head as you were talking. <laughs> and so for me, so I'm challenging it in myself a lot since then, really. Mm. And I think a key to me being somewhat successful at doing that is that I very much don't want to be someone who's rigid or psychologically inflexible. So when I spot myself being that, I've got a strong motivation to challenge it. So Mm. when somebody sees something as a characteristic they don't want to have, Mm. does that help them to change? Certainly in my experience, it is doing. Yeah. I mean, this will be a bit of a bit meta, but if you're if you're rigidly attempting not to be something or behave in a certain <laughs> way, then you, you're not being psychologically flexible. Like many clients say they don't want to be anxious or they don't want to be depressed. And the more we do don't want something, then the more we focus on the thing we don't want. So I mean wanting to be flexible is a good start. But when we start using the musts and the shoulds and the Yes. You know, we get we get into that no but frame of mind rather than the yes and. Um, well, well, we we will be inflexible sometimes, just like we will feel depressed or overjoyed sometimes, you know. And it's important not to be become attached to being flexible. Yeah, because that's I think, inflexible. Yeah, <laughs> I think what I'm doing when I spot it in myself is I go oh you're digging your heels in that's always the image I get is digging my heels in and then I kind of say is that how you want to be on this topic yeah so it may be that I feel strongly about something and I'm digging my heels in because I feel strongly about it yeah Um, in which case yes carry I'll carry on digging those heels in Mm. I think it's about making myself reflect every time. Yeah. Is this something you want to be this rigid about? Or is this yeah. something you want to loosen up about? Mm. Is this the hill you want to die on? Is this the exactly. thing I really, you know, am I really going to, is this really what I want to fight over? You know, is this really what I want to have left over from my, you know, at the end of my life? Is this really? When someone comes into my house, is this really who I am? Probably not. And I think that's really healthy to be questioning it and asking that because it might be that this is something that you do want to dig your heels in about. You do want that particular thing and you do need to find some way to incorporate that into your life somehow. Um, But, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's about being flexible about being inflexible because sometimes as you say you will be you will dig your heels and you will say no I am keeping that for whatever reason um and I think you know we all we're all inflexible sometimes (laughs) very much very much so so a different study this one by Clarissa Ong and colleagues looked into whether psychological inflexibility mediated the relationship between distress and hoarding and also between hoarding severity and life satisfaction. 
what does this mean? <laughs> like, literally don't understand what they said. <laughs> now, just just an inside, people, i just let you know that I had to delay tonight <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> and Clarissa, I love you. And Jennifer, I love you both. You're awesome because I love your work. But I had to read this a couple of times because my brain, I just was going, oh, I can't, you know, my brain's a little bit out of research, you know, out of research mode. But mediation is a statistical analysis that's used to attempt to kind of show some form of causality, right? It basically okay. shows how a third variable affects the relationship between two other variables. So you're trying to kind of create a path. There will be other, I mean, we know there's a million other variables there, but if we can show a path uh, yeah. from A to C via B, then we can kind of go, well, that looks like that influences, this influences that. So responding to distress with rumination and worry is like a significant pathway that leads to hoarding. So we get that distress, we worry, we ruminate, et cetera, and then it leads to saving in the present. So basically it's just saying when distress shows up, a rigid focus on those future emotional states pop up, like worrying it's going to last forever, and that leads us to save in the present which makes complete sense and I think it's definitely a pathway and it's something that I see every day. So it's nice that it's been demonstrated in a mediation analysis. The other, the other finding was that the way people relate to their symptoms as well as to thoughts and feelings about their symptoms negatively influence their life satisfaction. Hoarding compromises life satisfaction by moving people away from those valued activities, which you've just spoken about. We can't, we can't connect with those values if we haven't got space to do whatever it is we want to do or we don't have the money because we've spent it on toilet paper or whatever that is. Now, there is a limitation with this study. It was college samples. It was college student sample. It wasn't clinical. But it is a good... Um, I do like the methodology. I do think they did a good job with um, with the variables that they selected. And I do, I love their work. So can't say anything negative about the dudes from Utah State or wherever they're from. I love them. So as you mentioned earlier, in the last episode with Jan, the one about insight, we talked about yes and, which is a technique used in comedy improv where instead of responding to situations or challenges with no but, which kind of shuts everything down, you respond with yes and and expand on something instead. In my experience, yes and produces less friction and less of a challenge. So when I'm aware that I'm being really rigid about something, Yes, anding it makes me more able to compromise and move forward because mm. I really want to keep this, but I shouldn't. Just mm. creates, this is a challenge, it's very difficult, I don't know what to do, I'll move on to the next thing. I really want to keep this and I really want the space, that's interesting I wonder if I want the space more or if, you know, it opens things up rather than shuts it down. Yeah. That's actually the whole concept, and this is coming up so much in my work at the moment, is whether someone values the space over the stuff. And I've had some experience lately where people feel like space is a waste it's valuable because it, it, it can have things in it. <laughs> yeah. And why would I have that space empty if I could have the stuff in it? I, I, you know, like that whole juggle. And I, I, was, I was just pondering that myself, thinking, oh, I really, I really value empty space, a clean slate. But does everybody feel that way? And how, how, can, how can people wrestle with that whole concept? But doing the and, the yes and, at least you're considering what the alternative is. Whereas when it's no but, it's usually 
end of story. But the yes and gives you that, ah, and I want this, okay, because I can want both things. I can, there are two things can be true at the same time. And that is really an important, it's an important kind of that, that curiosity, open to experience, you know, that's, that's kind of how we have to, or we have we don't have to do anything, but how how we sh- I'm trying to say should now? Goodness me! <laughs> how we could? I just how we might. <laughs> I I just said should could people don't 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 should yourself people. But yeah, I mean it's it, you know it, it's a way to approach things that does offer you more options rather than shutting it down. I think that is 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 really important. So. Having been making a concerted effort to be less rigid with regards to my possessions and also my behaviours, although it's been focused on hoarding, has actually expanded into the rest of my life. I find myself more willing to try new things and test things, compromise a bit, take tiny risks. So where... We know that being limited and controlled over one thing never just sticks to that one part of your life. I'm finding that neither does learning to let go a little bit at a time. Is that a common experience? Yes, and it's the kind of idea of ACT, you know, that that because these are processes, the more we practice in one area, it's going to rub off in every area of their life. We're going to start to see it happening at home, at work, with relationships, all sorts of areas. With cooking, like literally I'm yes. cooking, cooking things I would never have cooked before because I'm going, well, let's see. Let's hmm. see. And and I, I had the, you know, the, the whole um, discussion of perfectionism. I mean, that's always really been something that's held me back. And it's taken me a long time to relax a little bit and let things not be perfect for just a moment, even if it's a week, not folding the laundry for a day. I mean, I I know this might sound crazy to some people, but I've had to force myself to let things stay disorganised. Yeah. So I'm just the opposite. I'm just the I'm the same, just opposite, right? I've got the same issues, just with a different, slightly different perspective. And I found it has helped me so much being a little bit less rigid about how things need to be. It's also improved my relationships with my husband, with my children, because I'm not nagging constantly about picking up their stuff, doing this, doing that. My husband and I have a bit of a game. We've been playing. We uh, realised that we were playing this game when one of us said to the other, I'm just how long is it going to be until you pick up that <laughs> that box that's been outside sitting on the veranda? And he laughed. He said, we've been playing the same game. Let's see who can last the longest <laughs> leaving the box there. And I just love that. I just love that. And it's still sitting out there, which is absolutely hilarious. It's been there two weeks. And I'm just loving the whole idea of it not being put in the bin because it's it just it's it's a symbol of me just relaxing and not taking everything so goddamn seriously and not having to be so perfect about everything. Um, but it, you know, it's taken me a long time to get there. But it, it's coming out in all sorts of different ways as I as I get older. It's yeah, they're underlying everything that we do in all areas. So yes, I think it is pretty common um, that it that, that it assists people, you know, not just with their hoarding, but with other things. So the paper by Kraft and colleagues mentioned that because psychological inflexibility looks like a significant issue in hoarding. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act um, might be useful because it includes treatments that have been developed specifically to target inflexibility. And the FANG paper shows promising results around ACT, hoarding and psychological flexibility. Now, of course, ACT is the kind of therapy you specialise in. Mm. So can you talk a bit about how you might go about 
tackling psychological inflexibility in a client who hoards? Mm, so the first step for me is values. So I always start there because if I know what the values are, um, you know, when 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 a, a therapist kind of knows what those values are, it allows them to understand the life that the client wants to live and help them accept that the behaviours they're engaging in are in direct opposite to those values. Nine times out of ten, there'll be a list of values and I'll be able to kind of discuss how their actions are not matching with those values. And that seems to be something that those papers that we discussed have kind of dug deeper into because I actually was interested in that myself, that there is that disconnect between the value and the action. Um, you know, I mean, if they've got a value around family and communicating, being able to sit at the table for a meal and talk about your day is where we can start to take action. If we can make some of those little things happen, then we're, we're giving them a sense that they are able to live in a way that they want. I also use, I always use the thought listing exercise. I couple that with their clearly articulated values. So then you've got a path. So when the client voices both, both of these themselves, they talk about their, you know, they talk about what their decisions are, what they're thinking about the item, and then what their values are, that's where kind of the magic happens because the client then finds their own path if I tell them that never helps it has to be in their own voice in their own words coming out of their own mouth and when they put those two things together which I I, I've got a wonderful client that I I adore all my clients but I've got a wonderful client that I'm working with at the moment and the thoughts come out about how these things could be used saved whatever and then the thought comes out but how is that You know, how is that leading me down the path to where I want to go? I want to have a bed that I can sleep in. I want to have, you know, uh, I want to have people around. This is, these two things don't fit. And it's every time, it's over and over again. And the more she does it, now it's kind of like automatic, thinking it through in her mind and, okay, no, I know someone else. And the other other thing that um, is always good to, to, to drop in there is just, helping them accept the negative emotions but still move forward, you know, like being able to sit with that feeling. Well, I'm feeling a bit average about this, so, you know, but be curious, see how long it lasts, you know, have a bit of a play around with it. How do you feel afterwards? Do a bit of journaling. I mean, I know a lot of people are not journal people, but even if it's just scribbling it out on a, you know, in a crappy notebook, but those experiments are kind of vital to opening up that path to change. And um, those are the things that really are, I mean, that's just it in a nutshell. That's it in a nutshell of how to kind of open up and help people move toward, you know, move in the direction of their compass, you know. A great deal of what I do is kind of allowing the client to be seen and heard and understood. <laughs> like, you know, course, to feel like yeah. you've been understood by someone, to, you know, someone who says, yeah, I, hey, this, I get it. I can see how hard this is. It's not easy. I mean, the work's not easy that we do on ourselves. But if we know what direction we're going using our values as our compass, you know, we can change. We can. We can change and we can move forward in our lives. Yeah. And also someone who listens and understands, but also someone who listens to some of the worst things about you and stays you know Mm. (laughs) like I'm thinking of my counsellor who I eventually told about hoarding and she's been lovely but also I was really scared for ages of having guests on the podcast because Mm. I was like but they'll know Mm. and the fact of my counsellor being so nice about it and the fact that not one guest has looked at me and gone, you do, oh, uh, you do what? You know? <laughs> exactly. And exactly. Obvi- obviously I choose guests carefully. <laughs> um, not going to get some like, I don't know, Jeremy Clarkson. I don't know why he's <laughs> on, you know, 
but the <laughs> the idea of somebody who can hear what you think is repugnant mm. and still be nice to you and stay mm. in the room and come back next week is yep. really healing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing I, you know, I want people to know is that I'll always come back. <laughs> I'll always come back. You know, I'll always be there. You know, whatever, however bad you think it might be, however, you know, terrible you think, you know, or however disgusted you are in yourself, I know that underneath all that, you just, you really just want change and you're willing to work to get it and that's all that matters to me just I'll come back every time I love that so Jan if people want to find you online where can they do so this is an interesting question you've never asked me I've never asked it before I know it will take a lot of thought and consideration Okay, so you can find me on Instagram, X and Pinterest, where I am at stuff underscore ology or Facebook at Stuffology Consulting, or you can drop me a line by email, jan at stuffology.com.au and also sign up for my newsletter. I send that out weekly and it's free. It's great. Strongly (laughs) recommend the newsletter. Jan, thank you very much. Thank you for having me yet again, and I'll see you next month. May we take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we record and listen to this podcast today. I am speaking on the lands of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge their connection to country, both land and sea, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today. I want to make sure I'm talking about the things you want to hear about. Are there things you wish the podcast covered or things you want to hear more of that I've already covered? You can let me know at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash topic. 
You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash support and do subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. There may be links in this podcast that earn me money. This doesn't come at any extra cost to you if you ever make a purchase through the links and it helps to support the future of the podcast. So in my experience, um, God, I've done lots of in my experiences here. So having been making the craft paper, we mm. <laughs> the paper by craft. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I have to say, send a note to Jennifer and go. We've been calling you it the craft paper. We don't mean to. <laughs> <sighs> So the paper by craft. Now on Broadway, an enemy of the people is a New York Times critic's pick. Jeremy Strong is one of the great actors of his generation, hails the Chicago Tribune. In a performance, the Wall Street Journal praises as powerfully affecting and bitterly funny. Michael Imperioli sets off sparks, cheers the Hollywood Reporter. Victoria Pedretti is luminous, rings variety. From director Sam Gold and playwright Amy Herzog, an enemy of the people is urgent, electrifying, and haunting, declares USA Today. An enemy of the people, on Broadway through June 16th only. Need new glasses or want a fresh new style? Warby Parker has you covered. Glasses start at just 95 bucks, including anti-reflective, scratch-resistant prescription lenses that block 100% of UV rays. Every frame's designed in-house, with a huge selection of styles for every face shape. And with Warby Parker's free home try-on program, you can order five pairs to try at home for free. Shipping is free both ways, too. Go to warbyparker.com covered to try five pairs of frames at home for free. WarbyParker.com slash covered. Hey everyone, Craig Robinson here. I want you to check out the Ways to Win podcast brought to you by Ford and the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. On Ways to Win, Coach Cal and I will discuss leadership lessons we've learned. We know all about the days spent perfecting your craft outside of the limelight and have knowledge to share about how strength, inspiration, encouragement, and adaptability are the key ingredients to drive toward your dreams. And those same ingredients can be found in the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. So check out my podcast, Ways to Win, and also check out the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. Learn more at Ford.com. Built Ford tough, built Ford proud.